Hello and welcome to the Military Family Learning Network's third annual virtual conference, Relationships for Readiness. I'm your host, Bob Birch. Great to have you back, or if you're just joining us for the first time, great to have you here today as we kick off day two of the conference. Uh, this is the conference that provides an opportunity to learn with service providers working across many disciplines uh, about the Department of Defense's family readiness system and how we can work within that system in a more networked way and with a more networked mindset. Uh, you can see our first presenter, Sunny Brown, uh, uh, doodling for us right now. Uh, I, I hope you'll join her. You can do that uh, if you'd like by downloading the Idea Catcher, a great resource inspired by Sunny's work and uh, created by uh, our MFLN staff, Jen Schielich, uh, created the beautiful idea catcher. You can download that. And Sunny, if you could, if you want to flip your page, we can see a little bit of the idea catcher there. Awesome. So there's the idea catcher journal, and you can download that on the Military Families Learning Network uh, virtual conference page. It's Military Families Learning Network slash VC 2019. Uh, as you use that idea catcher and as you do your doodles today, uh, we encourage you to snap a picture of them and tweet them out to us at MILFAMLN using the hashtag MFLNVC. We'd love, we had some great sharing going on uh, around the doodles yesterday and we'd like to see even more uh, today as we continue to uh, not just learn from our uh, presenters this week but also learn from each other. So there we go. So uh, let's get going on our first session of the day, visual thinking for try and work in a more networked way and in a network mindset. Um, it really is about changing the way that we work. And one of the things uh, that we want to change is, you know, how we approach creativity. And that's what uh, today's session is about, about thinking outside the box, adopting new ways of working, working with new people and organizations, and hopefully unlocking your creativity today and thinking visually as you consider the the family readiness system and network concepts and try and apply them to your own situation and experiences. So let's welcome our speaker for today, Sunny Brown. Sunny founded the SB Inc. Creative Consultancy over 12 years ago. She's the author of Game Storming and the Doodle Revolution and leads a worldwide campaign advocating for visual game design and improvisational thinking as a global info doodler. <laughs> Sunny Brown, welcome Thank to the conference. Thank you. Thank you so much. I know that was a mouthful of a lot of foreign words. <laughs> That's okay. Thank you. I, I liked the challenge. Yes. Yeah. You're up for it. You're up for it. Um, so is this my segue? This okay, is. Awesome. Go ahead. Yeah. Awesome, Bob. Thank you so much for having me. And I'm so glad to be here. And I'm so glad that there are people chiming in from all over for the United States. Um, I'm not gonna leave, my, my brother refers to this as my poodle haircut. So I'm not gonna leave this on here much longer, but the summation of this is that uh, this, um, this field of study, I have been very, very interested in for a very long time. And there are reasons for that. Not only the insight and create, creative problem solving piece, but also the fact that it um, deeply enables analysis, critical thinking, imagination, problem solving, all the things that you are looking for when you're trying to do some kind of complex, grappling with complex information. So I'm really passionate about it and that will probably come through as I go because I get a little nerdy and I'm just not going to be sorry about that, that one. You know? <laughs> so the learning objectives, um, I'm not going to read these for you, but in a nutshell, what I want y'all to do is get a general overview of what visual thinking is, why it's interesting, why it's useful, and start to have an idea of how you might integrate it into your own life and work. Because it is a very broad and very deep field, and it has a lot of applications. And so however you want to enter and however you want to apply it is, is talk about visual language and, and uh, representing concepts. And we're going to talk about some basic techniques. But ultimately, I want you to start thinking about how you're going to make it matter for you in your life and your work. And perhaps in the chat function, we can actually have some questions that are specific to you, which I'd be happy to answer. <clears throat> so I wanted to start with this because it's been my experience that when we start school, what we ultimately run into is what I call the wall of 
words. So um, visual language is native to human beings and it's, it's a very powerful and natural expression of how we think. But when we go into primary school, we just end up in the swimming in these waters. And that really doesn't ever stop. And um, I call it also the blah, 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 blah. And it's a shame because it's a missed opportunity. And it's not, you don't have to be um, a unique learner or have a diverse learning style to, to be amenable and responsive to visual language. As it turns out, it's a really powerful tool for all types of learners. And we lose the opportunity to, to take it with us as we go on the learning journey and that's sort of why I'm so passionate about visual thinking because it's it's a power tool that you can use to supplement learning not to subtract from the traditional literacy and learning process so just really quickly what do we know about visuals in the brain so you have um, this outer mammalian bark that is called it's actually what makes us um, distinguishes us from animals and it's called the cerebral cortex okay and we all have one so that's comforting <laughs> but uh, this is your cerebellum and that's responsible your cerebellum is responsible for your um, autonomic nervous system and most of your motor functions this is not controlled by us and then the middle of the brain is the limbic system which is emotion and motivation and so forth so the cerebral cortex here's what's so crazy about this outermost mammalian bar is that it is dedicated to processing sensory information and it's also our executive Centers, so it's responsible for language and communication and social behavior and um, all the things that we think kind of make us more sophisticated than my beloved pets, um, which that is debatable. However, uh, what it does is it processes sensory information and make, helps us make sense of the world. And so here's what's so crazy about that cerebral cortex is that of the five senses, 75% of the cerebral cortex in terms of information processing is dedicated to processing visual information meaning i think you know what that means if we're not integrating visual language into our thinking and cognition processes there is a major channel that is not open and there's really no reason for that there is some resistance to it and i'm going to talk a little bit about what you might encounter if you decide to integrate visual thinking and visual language what types of resistance you might encounter but ultimately if we're only engaging the linguistic channel the standard traditional linguistic channel then none of this becomes available which is you know if you actually think it through it is um, totally asinine so that's the opportunity we're going to leverage today and I don't want to use terms without describing them so for now I'm going to revisit info do link a little bit further down the line so for now I just want to tell you what visual thinking ultimately is it's a field of study it has, as I mentioned earlier, it has depth and width and deep practices, but it uses the integration of visual information in all kinds of different ways in order to support the thinking process, right? That's the intention of visual thinking. And it can take many, many forms. So if you look at this, like visual thinking could be a napkin sketch that you do on your own or at happy hour with your friends. It can be a private experience when you're journaling and you're just sort of thinking things through in ways that are different from uh, traditionally writing a list or journaling. It can be a crystallized information graphic. This is a final piece and it doesn't show the multiple iterations that occurred before it, or it can be a large scale participatory process that is, um, we're gonna talk about that as well. So I don't, don't want it to be defined only by sort of specific ways of entering. I, the intention is to have it speak to you. So however you land on whatever spectrum of visual comfort levels you find yourself in, um, those are all welcome and available. And I'm going to talk about info doodling shortly, but visual thinking is a, is a very broad field. And here's an example of what it could look like in a certain setting. And as you can see, um, she is not a sophisticated visual thinker in terms of her artistry, right? So look at the, um, the rudimentary nature nature of this language. She nevertheless is telling a story. She's going to be able to create an artifact, communicate that story to other people going forward, and she doesn't have to have any special training or skill. So this is important to see. This is an example of a product pitch. And also you'll notice that there's a lot of sticky notes. In visual thinking processes, we use all um, tools to facilitate the activation of, um, of the cerebral cortex and the multi-sensory modes, including 
including sticky notes and index cards and any office supplies that is going to give you a deeper and more robust relationship with learning, right? So, so it does not have to be something special. It actually has to be something that's kind of democratized. So as it relates to info doodling, um, first I want to describe what doodling actually is. So I don't know, I wish you could raise your hand in the chat and tell me how many of you are actually doodlers or identify as doodlers or people who, if you don't like the, the term, if, if you are people who find yourself sketching in the margins of your papers when you're sitting through a long meeting, and I know, I know a lot of you do that sneakily, so you probably don't want to tell me, but this is a natural, doodling is a natural process that happens to all children and all adults across socioeconomic boundaries around the world and across time. Since uh, since Homo sapiens about 30,000 years ago, we have been doodling on cave walls and in the snow and sand. And the the, re the value of it, I know historically that it has a bad rap, but the value of doodling is that it is the making of spontaneous visual marks to support the thinking process. Okay, so let's just start with the basic definition, which is to elevate cognition. I'm going to draw my rudimentary brain, okay? Yay, right? And so when you actually look at people who are engaging in the practice of spontaneous visual language, <clears throat> excuse me, what they're doing is, is helping themselves focus, not check out, pay attention, remember. So this has been redefined to mean to make a version of doodling as what I refer to as the info doodle. And I'm going to give you some tools to learn how you might do some visual translation, which is what info doodling is for yourself. So if you take like a 300 page document and you want to glean the, the most relevant nuggets from it and translate them visually so that they're more memorable and interesting for, for others, that, that's what info doodling is. It's taking sophisticated, complex information and giving it a more robust um, relationship with the learner. And the reason for that is the following. So everything is about knowledge exploration in terms of visual thinking. And we want all of these things to be happening. And so that's why it's such a powerful tool because it's native and natural and it actually facilitates a lot of these things. So let me tell you about some of the gifts of it, just in case there are some skeptics, which is understandable. <clears throat> I myself was a skeptic, actually. I was very committed to this. Um, I thought that this made made me smart and I thought that this is what my teachers wanted and I thought this is what my bosses wanted so this is also what I was focused on but over the years as I observed visual thinkers in action and doulers in action I started to cluster categories of value that these things were being gifted to us by the info doodle and those fall into the first category which is power so cognitive power obviously when you are trying to grapple with something sophisticated you're going to need as much cognitive power as you can muster, right? Particularly you guys who have just sort of been given this significant directive from the DOD that has probably some gaps in what exactly you're supposed to do. And so you need to get um, all, all, all cylinders firing to figure out how to live up to these expectations and these requests, right? So you need all, all of your faculties online. And thankfully, the info doodle does activate all these things. So this one I think is the most interesting. Um, because it activates all the other ones. So the extended mind, let me just talk about this for, for a second. When um, you have what's called working memory, and working memory is the capacity to hold chunks of information in, in a period of time that allows you to do stuff with that information. It's called working memory because it means you're working, right? So interestingly, they don't know exactly Exact. There's no like one figure where we know, oh, okay, this number of chunks of data is what people can hold. Seven, the reason phone numbers used to have just seven, we didn't have uh, 512 and 250 and the, um, what do you call it, the area code? They were seven digits because that's, on, for most people, that's the average number of things that they can hold in one uh, sitting. So we don't have, um, we're not super, super amazing at uh, working memory. And, uh, but it ranges from like five to 15. But what happens when you allow for the visualization of content is that you basically create a space where you can store and stash all this other data 
so that when you start to grapple with it, this becomes your extended mind. This becomes your working memory. This becomes your knowledge space. And that allows you to work with more complex, sophisticated information. So um, it's not to be underestimated. Like you want to externalize what you're thinking and what you're holding because it supports you in juggling multiple variables so you can arrive at some conclusion. Okay. And when you have this extended mind in place, I love that the arrow's pointing. That's fantastic. Um, it increases all these things, recall, comprehension, insights, and ultimately creativity. So cognitive power is not a small deal when it, when it comes to integrating visual language. The other one is performance. This one is also not to be underestimated. When you use visual thinking in a group setting, so when remember when I showed you pictures earlier of uh, the, the group of women working on the wall? When you put it inside of a group or an organization, you would not believe what happens. Um, they everything that you want to turn on turns on. So, and I've seen this hundreds and hundreds of times. So conversations get more interesting. They deepen. They accelerate. People start to be able to share mental models that they have have hidden, and they start to articulate them with each other so that they can then have a real meaningful conversation around oh are we on the same page we're not quite on the same page here are the places where we could be on the same page right and so you also get the and, and, and you know you guys know this from military planning like part of this um a, a lot of you do part of that is why the military is so skillful at integrating visualization because it's how, when you're in environments that um i don't know if you guys are familiar with that the acronym VUCA, which is volatile unpredictable um chaotic and um, ambiguous, then having these panorama of visual information is a total game changer. And, and it has that impact in organizations as well. So there's no reason why we civilians shouldn't bring this into our processes and figure out how to leverage it. So, so big win on performance and organizational performance. And then the last one is actually kind of lovely, which is, is that it's just actually a simple pleasure, you know? So I have observed doodlers in the wild and um they seem to be once once they get into a slower state they find that i find that they um their systems get regulated so their physiology changes their breathing um slows their heart rate slower and they actually a lot of the anxiety that they all human beings carry with you is decreased and so that's also quite a gift from something that seems relatively simple and what happens in the learning process when people soften into a different state of mind is that um, these things become more available. So when you're tense, it's you, you tend to habituate. We all tend to habituate back to our traditional pattern. When we're loose, other things become available to us. And that's not a small gift either, right? So ultimately, you have some major wins from integrating really even basic visual language, okay? And I want to give you some images of what it might look like, you know, in environments that you find yourself. So, and, and, and talk about what those, why those matter. So engagement, right? When you're trying to get multiple stakeholders to participate in something, it's a really useful way to get them interested, paying attention, curious, wondering what's happening. And if you look at this, this is all sticky notes and dots. So there's not any drawing, there's no sketching, there's no doodling. These are sketches that are created by the participants, but you can do quite a bit of, of deep engagement with just basic sticky notes and visual language. And you can also do what I call our fire starters, meaning that they are um, provocations. So they get people thinking differently. Like if you're um, suddenly tasked with innovating across your network, you're gonna need people to think differently. And so you need them to be engaged and interested. Like, have you ever been in a meeting where they go, okay, guys, everybody's sitting around a table and it's like, okay, guys, like, what's your best idea for the next, uh, for the next, like, um, you know, uh, product development? And it's, it's, they're basically asking people to come up with an idea in the absence of any multi-sensory stimulus. It's totally bananas from my perspective and engagement is low, understandably, and, and the, there's no fires being started. So this is a seemingly simple, but it's super, super useful. Connectivity. So this is relevant 
particularly for you guys in your network, right? So um, connectivity has a lot of depth to it. So you have everything is happening in an interconnected web. There's no, you, can, you actually can't be an isolated individual in this reality because there's the fabric of everything is interdependent and interconnected. And so it's nice to be able to actually see that and understand that and leverage it. People in processes and systems. And so um, these are images of where the connectivity in this particular experience was people, but you can also use visual language to, to create sort of um, like topographical maps and to have start conversations around where are the links between uh, what you do and what I do? Where are the links on of your your responsibilities in mind? Where are the links and partners that we need to form or partnerships that we need to establish? So it, it allows for this exploration of this interdependency and it allows for an investigation into that so you can leverage it, right? This one is also uh, delightful. It doesn't only have to be about solving problems. A lot of times visual language is specific to discovery and play. Um, I want to check the chat to see if you guys are doing all right how are y'all doing all is well hey sonny wanna... it looks like everyone it, it, all is well lots of sharing about how they doodle and um how they use it to unlock their thinking oh good um, but i don't see any pressing questions okay awesome so, so there's just good like engagement very nice um so discovery and play this is one of my favorite ones because it seems like it's trivial or it's just for the sheer joy of it but the truth is that when you create spaces in which people are allowed to activate um, multiple parts of their being, so their gestural parts, their motor skills, their semantic um, intelligence, their visual intelligence, then what you find is that whole new possibilities become uh, available and interesting and, um, and activated. And when you are grappling with something that is challenging and has been challenging for a really long time, letting people People, um, sift through that in a way that is non-traditional changes um, the what is possible and it changes the experience of the people and it gets them really excited and interested so I love this because part of this like you can always move into problem solving and you can always move into analysis we're pretty good at that but it's not it's very rare that we allow for this aspect of it, which actually gives us better ideas to pursue often, you know? And this one I know a lot of engineers will love. And I also love this one, system and process exploration. So it's been my experience that when people are working together, there's like, they have these ideas about reality in their head. So this dude has this idea. And let's make this a lady so we just be cool. Okay, this lady has this idea, and they're speaking to their individual realities, and they're confident that the other person is also seeing what they see, <laughs> which is pretty rare, unless you guys have some kind of mind melding that, that you can do. So what's beautiful about this aspect is that you start to visually articulate the systems that you're thinking about and the processes that you're thinking about not so that your version is the right version, but so that you now have handles to explore your shared realities or your unshared realities. And once you can do that, then you can accelerate what uh, the path that you're going to take, or you can start to understand, oh, the relationships are breaking down here, or the system is breaking down here. But until you have some kind of visual representation of it, it's just two people talking to their own reality. I call it the fishbowl, where you have your own fishbowl over your head and you sort of project what you see inside of your fishbowl and then wonder why other people don't understand what you're talking about, you know? <laughs> uh, so this one is big and it has a lot of potential, particularly with the FRS um, system that you guys are starting to build and to um, elevate. Sticky problem solving. I hope it's become clear that this is also a tool for deep, deep problem solving. Again, you see this group and they're using sticky notes and they're using grids and they're using structures and they're asking interesting questions. The sun just went down. It got so dark. Um, let me turn this up. There. Okay. So they're asking interesting questions of each other. And so it's not, not only a discovery and play, imagination and all those wonderful things it's also really 
deep problem solving. And you can actually sequence visual thinking experiments one after the other to solve a deeper, stickier problem. And you can um, invite multiple stakeholders to start solving it with you. So when I was referring back to that organizational performance piece, that's part of why it's useful because you get many minds working on the same problem. And then last, innovation, right? So it's going back to that notion that um, we, we are supposed to just kind of readily come up with some new way to engage when the truth is the brain has a strong preference for habituated trails. Like we like our cow paths and the brain, because it's kind of the brain is efficient slash lazy. So it has a strong preference of going down already established trails, right? So it's just like, what restaurants do I want to eat at? Oh, the same three that I always eat at, right? So to get the brain to innovate, you have to jog it. You have to ask it. You have to sort of um, confuse it on some level and ask it to collide two different things that normally would not meet each other. And th this is a gorgeous way to do that as well because you're embedding um, visual thinking and visualization into what I refer to as thought experiments that ultimately break the cow paths of the brain and um, not forever you can always go back to the same old trail but um, you can use visual thinking to activate deep innovation and really um, powerful creative insights so here's the resistance right if you take visual thinking and visual language to your workplace or to your home or even to your own uh, journal you are going to run into some barriers and that doesn't mean they're not it's not to be stopped by them it's to acknowledge that they're there and I've found that when we acknowledge that they're there then we can overcome them right so this is still true this is changing rapidly but it is true a lot of times people confuse visual language with art it is definitely not about art and I love art I'm not saying anything about art I, I, I'm not an artist I'm not experienced with art I'm not an art historian I grew up blue collar and art was not something that was in the, really even in our awareness, to be totally honest. I'm not proud, I'm just saying. And so visual language is just very distinct from art in the following ways. So art is typically purposefully subjective. So uh, people that are creating art are not interested in um, the clarity of the communication. They're more, more interested in the viewer having interpretation of it. And, and visual thinking is, 100% about no people knowing what you're talking about and why. So visual thinking is not um, is not gunning for being subjective. The other thing is art tends to be emotive. So uh, part of the intention of it is to like awaken, like to stir you, to move you, to awaken um, um, parts of you that may have been sleeping for a long time, and that's wonderful and beautiful. Um, but it's not the role of visual thinking. So um, visual thinking. It does have emotional components. There are aspects of it that certainly do stir and move people, depending on what kind of experiment you're doing. But it's not the intention of it. It is not to get to provoke a sort of emotional response. And then the last one is, art is not rapid. <clears throat> I just took, you guys aren't going to believe this, but I just took my first drawing lesson. I've been a professional visual thinker for 12 years, and I took my first drawing lesson Monday, and um, it was a, a trip. But so, what she said that I have really has really stuck with me is that art is manual labor, meaning that it takes hours and hours and hours and hours to produce something like this. And visual thinking is rapid. Okay, it is like part of the simplicity of it. Part of the value of it is its simplicity and its rapidity. So you can have a meeting that's an hour. And you can get quite a bit done and you can actually solve a problem or come to some clarity and it doesn't take that much time. So it's very, very, very different from art in lots of other ways that I didn't even mention. And the other reason why just from a sort of branding perspective, if you want to walk in and tell an organizational story about visual language, then you don't want to equate it with art because this is how Americans think of art, right? Like raise your hand if you ever grew up or if any of you said to your parents I want to be an artist and then they just protested with all of these things so the easiest way to do it is just never equate it with art equate it with thinking and you're gonna be golden here's an example another example of visual language would you refer to this as art probably not 
right? This is a system and a process map combined, and it uses very rudimentary visual uh, information, probably not considered art. Probably you would not consider this art, right? These are large scale visual structures and architectures that are designed to put content in and populate it with content and then think things through. Also not art. Is it joyful and playful and fun? Yes. Is it art? Not necessarily. This is not art. Now, um, this is not going to end up hanging in a museum anywhere, right? So, and you can see the traditional sticky notes. This is one of my doodles that I did with a client. But, and there, are, and it actually, this looks sophisticated, but when you actually break it down, it's circles, arrows, squares, and more squares, and sticky notes. So, nothing particularly artistic about this, just straight up simple lines, okay? Here's another thing that you you're probably going to run into when you win and if you decide to integrate visual literacy into your life. You're going to give yourself the business, you know. You're going to say this, I can't draw. And, and my question to you is, why would you be able to draw? When we talked earlier about when you enter into school, they're not encouraging that we learn how to draw. There's no reason for us to know how to draw. Um, it does, that's like saying, oh, I don't know how to snow ski. And I've never been to a mountain. There's no reason for you to know how to snow ski, right? So it's kind of an unfair expectation that we would even have for ourselves, considering how long it takes to learn how to draw, to like officially draw. But more importantly, I think the question is, um, I am not interested in becoming a professional basketball player, right? So I have no ambition of being Michael Jordan. Does that mean that I don't shoot hoops? No, it does not mean that. So just because you're not going to become a sophisticated Michelangelo does not mean that you cannot use simple and even rudimentary visual language to support your own thinking process. So we just need to get past this notion that it has anything to do with accurate visual representations or some kind of aesthetic beauty. It has to do with making your own process of understanding deeper. And so this is what everyone says. Even with a ruler, I can't draw a straight line. And I don't, don't care. I don't, don't need you to draw straight lines. I don't need you to draw perfect circles. I don't need you to draw anything perfect. Perfection is not the point. You know, it's absolutely the antithesis of the point because we're doing rapid visual thinking. So this heliocentric drawing, this is Copernicus finally telling the world that the sun does not, in fact, revolve around Earth. And, of course, this looks like a flawless iteration, but I guarantee you he had multiple clumsy iterations prior to that, all of which led up to this lovely one that he did with the compass. Um, and most importantly, this is a visual summation of 405 pages of words, numbers, and equations. So it, visual thinking has a, it packs a punch. It has a communication power that is untapped most of the time. Because if he gave the general population this, they're not, the, the big message is not going to get through. So visual language gives you the power to give the big message, the big summation, and people are going to remember it and retain it because, as I mentioned earlier, the cerebral cortex is thirsty for visual information and it's really hard for us to not remember an image once we've seen it. So there's so many reasons to integrate it. But perfection is decidedly not the point. I don't like it when people um, call me an expert because I actually am not interested in expertise. I'm interested in experimentalism. That's how you get good. So this is the point. And I know I've emphasized this and I've driven this home, but, but I want to also show you. So these are students, right? These are students learning particle motion as, as it relates to temperature. They are drawing that because that's going to cement the concept for them. And it doesn't need to be gorgeous. It needs to be accurate. And they can draw it multiple times for the accuracy to come into fruition. It does not have to happen right out of the box. That would be a quest for perfection, which is not really a thing. Um, it is in our minds. It's not in practice. And the same true here. So these are students learning how to visualize concepts so that they actually improve their relationship with those concepts. So let's just say you've gotten past those barriers. So you get that it's not about perfection. You get that it's not about um, being an artist. You get why it's valuable. So this is where we get challenged, right? How do we actually do it? And there are um, many fantastic books on this. And I have given a PDF to the crew that you guys can download if you are interested in 
learning more about how to do it. But, but um, this is your one of your biggest entry points. So if you would take your um, idea journal, your idea catcher, and draw with me, that would be awesome. And it's going to feel rudimentary, but there's a point to this, okay? The visual alphabet, just like when you learn your ABCs, I'm waiting for that to focus, just like when you learn your ABCs and you put those letters together to form words and those words form paragraphs and those paragraphs form sentences, the same is true with visual language. So you have um, 12 forms and fields and they are, just draw them with me, okay? Because there's not a single one of you who cannot do this. I have seen people do this drawing with their feet. So let's draw it first and then I'll put this all together why it matters. Point, okay, line. I'm doing mine a little darker just so you can see really clearly. Angle. Sorry, arc. Angle. Spiral. Loop. Mm-hmm. Did y'all draw that with me? I hope you did. I can hear your breathing slowing as we speak, or some of you are panicking, unclear. Um, then we have, of course, your basic rectangular square, circle or oval, I, house, or, or polygon, and cloud. I just met a newscaster the other day that specifically draws clouds. Everybody has their signature doodle. <clears throat> and um, I wonder what yours is. You guys put in a chat what your signature doodle is, just in case you want to see. A signature doodle is the thing that you, you draw when you're not trying to, it's not goal oriented. You're not trying to do anything other than just sort of stay present on the phone or whatever. So put in the chat. I'm going to show you all my signature doodle. I've done, I've I've done this since I was like seven. Um, and I think it's so strange now that I see it. Like it kind of looks like a neurological pathway, but I didn't, of course, know what that was when I was seven. But everybody has one. You will be surprised. All presidents, all kings, all queens, they all have a signature doodle. And um, anyway, I, I digress. Um, <laughs> uh, so the visual alphabet is so useful and valuable. For, so for those of you who do not identify as being skillful or creative or, or sophisticated with visual language, you don't need to be, right? You just need this basic alphabet. And I'll give you an example of what I mean. So if I want to draw a coffee cup, right, this can be broken down into an arc, an arc, an oval, two more arcs, another arc, and a line. Every single thing that you can see or imagine can be broken down into a basic visual alphabet. Now, I just went to the Toledo Museum of Art and I talked to a bunch of artists and they were horrified. <laughs> like they invited me to speak, but they were also like, oh, you can't teach people so quickly. And I'm like, you can. And, and look at it, we did. So <clears throat> they are learning the value of visual thinking because they um, it really is sort of the antithesis of these elaborate three-dimensional heavily shaded representations of reality so because for us we're doing rapid visual thinking right so the visual alphabet makes that so simple so give me something else to draw bob can you like just whatever somebody says to draw i'm going to just demonstrate it one more yeah time. you bet um i'll wait for someone to post something i'll as we do that i'll share some of people's signature doodles arrows 3d boxes flowers rainbows stars mm -hmm. uh a freckle face with curly hair and that was a good one um uh so we've had a request for a puppy and a dog so maybe a middle a, a, a teenage dog or something like <laughs> okay so watch this you guys like, like i don't totally um have a plan right because I'm, I'm an experimentalist so i'm gonna draw a puppy i do love a puppy apparently somebody else does too um look and you know what I'm going to do? Like, I'm going to draw it. Like, I wonder if this will look fun, hilarious if I drew the tail. Like, he's straight ahead. Or, or she. So you can see, and there would hypothetically, there would be a back and there would be back legs. 
but that took, you know, I don't know, seven seconds. And um, it doesn't even need to be, it, as you can see, what is this one called? I know, probably a note, sort of an oval. And, and then there's a arc and an arc. There's straight lines. There's um, another arc and a straight line, dot, dot, right? So here's the cool thing about visual language is that, remember I talked about how it's not intended to be subjective. So I do not make people speculate on what I drew. I just tell them what it is. So even if it, and here's what's amazing too about the mind and how much it longs for visual language. The mind is very generous. So if I draw like this and, and I say to you, it's a face, you're just gonna like do the summation. You're gonna collapse these two ideas. So even if it doesn't look like a face right away, if I tell you it's a face, your brain's gonna go, oh, okay, well, I could, I could see how that's a face. So it's okay to use them to lean on each other. So you use visual language and language to support each other and to lean on each other. So even if your first iteration, because a lot of times people ask me to draw stuff I actually cannot draw. I don't know how to do it. So I have to do multiple iterations of it. Um, like a bicycle, I always mess up a bicycle. I mean, clearly I know it has this, you know? It has circle, circle, line, line, make an oval just for fun. Um, and then like whatever, that's a line, a line. And let's just pretend like that's, you know, fine. It's clearly a, probably a, what's that word? A, uh, um, ergonomically just hellish I don't know but uh but it's fine I'll first of all I can draw it multiple times second of all I can label it right so don't be shy just to break things down into their fundamental elements and tell people what they are because they're going to use it to think and it doesn't have to be flawless okay so the visual alphabet big best friend of yours and also it's in the book that um I feel like I can't say my book but um it's in there <laughs> um all right so I want to give y'all, in the time we have left, I wanted to give you some um, really sort of pragmatic experimentations that you can do with visual thinking that don't even require um, icons or images or symbols necessarily. They can just give you a visual structure, okay? Oh, and maybe I should say one thing about this. The reason you would want to draw these things is because they are representative of concepts, right? So sometimes you are actually designing a bicycle and you to figure out how to draw a bicycle. Other times you're trying to convey some concepts to people. So a coffee cup is, yes, it is a noun and it is an actual object, but it also is representative of something, right? So what does coffee mean to people? It means energy. It means waking up, right? It means relaxation, like meaning you're in a, in a recliner. It means relax. Sometimes it means Starbucks, whatever, you know, all of these <laughs> images are representative of semantic concepts. So that's why you want to learn how to draw um, any, anything you need to. And last point about that, when you're moving into an environment and you know it's going to be about, for example, relocation, then you know there's 10 concepts that you may be probably drawing that are connected to relocation. And you can actually create what I refer to as a graphic vocabulary so that when you go into that session, you know how to draw house, um, uh, postal service, you know, um, um, financing, like you have icons for these things. So th I hope that was a decent example. I'm just, just trying to express that the visual alphabet is useful for conveying ideas and concepts, and that's why you would want to take it. So post the path. So I'm going to give you three experiments that we're going to do together. And you can follow along with me on your in your idea catcher journal because uh, these are really useful and you can use them right away. And, and I just want to sort of um, wake your mind up to the possibilities, even if you're not comfortable drawing the puppy or a coffee cup, right? So post the path. This is an awesome visual process. So if I want to show, for example, the path to financial stability, right? And actually, I had to just do this six months ago because I'm in between, uh, I'm designing a new business. And so I need to figure out what is the truth about my financial situation. So how, how my husband and I run this experiment, we use sticky notes. And 
so we say we did a brainstorm like okay here are the multiple variables connected to getting toward financial stability or taking a financial risk whatever your conversation is about and so he and i each brainstormed individual steps that we would put on these sticky notes right, right? so together we didn't do we, we did them separately and then stuck all of our things on our wall together okay so it's just a quick brainstorm and then after we had our, our sense about what are all the things we would need to be thinking about if i wanted to get a handle on my finances so i could take a certain type of risk then we start sticking those into a path so let's just say the goal is this particular instance my goal was to um get really crystal clear on my hard costs my fixed costs and my um variable costs so that i could reduce those so that i could take um some time off to write another book and so forth so we just sequence those things we're like okay well step one of doing that would be to <clears throat> identify let's just say i'm actually doing the content identify fixed versus variable costs right so that's what would be on that sticky note, right? And then maybe step two is figuring out, okay, um, what are the things I wanna let go of? So I know that I have to identify my variable costs. So then I wanna figure out what are the things that I let go of. And underneath that stage, I could actually write those on sticky notes and I could say vacations, which is what I did. I'm not gonna take any vacations anytime soon. Um, and I could also say, like, I have discovered cost me 3000 a year, which is so inappropriate. I can't even tell you. And so I stopped doing that. Um, so you can actually list those underneath it, right? But you kind of get the idea. It's like, here is the goal, financial stability for the next six months, right? Sort of like anchoring myself in it and, and post the path. So like when you post the path, you're not holding that in your mind. There is nothing more stressful than holding an unknown future in your mind and circling it inside of your psyche when you go to bed and when you wake up. So when you create this path for yourself, you know where you're headed. You have an anchor in time and space. It's been externalized. It's been compared. You and your partner have talked it over. You and your friends have talked it over. So it's been sort of like more thorough in terms of understanding it. And you can check it off when you're done right so it gives you the sense of accomplishment so it's a very very simple visual structure that points you toward the future that you design and that gives you a sense of accomplishment anchors you in time and space and forces you out of your ruminating pattern of like trying to figure out what are all the things you can do you can actually see them right so that's post the path um does, does anybody have questions about that particular experiment before i go to the second one cool I need to, should I open the chat, Bob? No, you're good. Uh, I'm keeping an eye on it. We'll give a second here to see if anyone has questions about that. We have some comments about uh, applying it uh, to different situations. Uh -huh. uh, so Lauren's asking, can you show us a path that isn't linear? Oh, yeah, there's like tons of, I mean, life is a circuitous path, right? And um, so let's just say, like deployment, right? So there was um, there was a five cycle. What was it? There was a uh, it was a five stage cycle of deployment. So like you're starting home and then you're coming home, right? So that path would be circular in some ways. It depends on how you want to look at it, but it would be circular in some ways. So you literally can just be like, here's where you start. Here's some of the um, incidences that are going to happen along the way. Here in the this stage here are some things to be uh, mindful of so to pay attention to in this stage here's some other things to be aware of so any um any path can take any shape technically they don't have to be linear they can also be circular they can have causal loops so they can go they can loop and then loop again here so there can be an internal loop like if you're on a path to you know medical recovery and there might be some setbacks on the way or some, you know, things like that. So it's um, any path is a great question. Thank you for asking it. Any path does not have to be linear, but to understand the nature of the path, it doesn't hurt to first put it in a linear structure and then be like, this doesn't really fit this. 
and then move it into a different kind of structure. That's also totally fine and actually part of the iterative process um, of thinking it through. And it makes you understand the path better because you're actually playing with it, not just in your mind. So this game is awesome. This game you have to play with another person. And um, for these two stages, you need another person. This is what I call the blind side, as you can see. And I really appreciate this exploration because we are often facing unknown futures and unknown um, circumstances. And so, and a lot of times when we know what we know, meaning that we are aware of what skills we have or what knowledge we have, then that we kind of can like put to bed because we're like, okay, we got that figured out. And when we know what we don't know, then that's also useful because then you have your power to figure out, okay, what I do not know is the following things and here's how I'm going to figure out how to solve them. Like I'm going to call MFLN and figure out what resources they have because I don't know how to plan my finances and I know that I don't know that, right? So also really useful. But then when you get to don't know, no, meaning like these are what we call unconscious competencies. When you have skills, but you actually don't know that you have them, other people who know you know that you have them, but you're not familiar with it. So like if I'm thinking about uh, joining one of the military branches and I don't actually know that I'm really good at uh, teamwork, it, it would be helpful for somebody outside of me to let me know like, like, oh, no, you actually are skillful at teamwork. So essentially, we're taking the content that is knowable and making it explicit and visual. And we're relying on a collaborative impact with somebody else to, um, to decrease the mystery of knowledge that we're grappling with, right? Um, and then don't, don't know, don't know. So this is an area where you can rely on somebody who's actually been through what you've been through before. So when people return home from deployment, there are people that have already been through that process. So they can actually tell you, oh, what you don't know you don't know is how critical sleep is. So you take a note and you put it on there, like how critical sleep is going to be for well-being and recovery and good, good mental attitude and so forth. They know that, right? So this, this is an experience of collaborative intelligence that you can quickly activate. It takes no time. You just draw, this is a persona, this is what's called a persona, and it can be you, and you can fill in as much as you want, and then you can request support around these, and you can socialize this artifact with anyone. So if you have it on a flip chart at your office, other people can come by and go, oh, she doesn't know that she actually knows how to pick up languages really quickly, because everything that we know about ourselves is relative to other people, so we need others to um, help us identify things about ourselves so they remove the blind side you know and that can be done in any number of topics that we are um, that are important for our well-being and important for our um, quality of life but we don't have all the data right so that's another really quick visual thinking experiment that is only relying on sticky notes and you know if you want to do a doodle of yourself in the middle and then the last experiment is what I refer to as heuristic ideation. This is relative to the innovation piece. And I wanted to put this in just because I think human beings miss opportunities for imagination quite a bit. Remember when I was talking earlier about the habituated paths? This is also true for how we think through our lives, how we think through our jobs, how we think through what's possible. And I think awakening the imagination is not just sort of a fanciful thing to do. It's actually a very powerful way to design your future going forward in um, trails that, that are otherwise not available because we're not actively using the imagination networks in the mind. So heuristic ideation. A heuristic is a DIY method for experimentation, which is just so huge. So in this particular example, what happens in this game is you put um, along the top of your column, you put toy, the, the goal is toy ideas, but along the top you put types of toys, and then along this side they, they put like categories of toys. And then it's just a mashup, you know? So this one, slot, I don't even know what a slot card is actually, do you guys? Um, this is a mashup 
ownership of the ideas for the collision of vehicles and racing. <clears throat> if it's, this, I wish I knew what a slot car. <laughs> like, what is that? So dolls. So if that were my mashup. So here, I'm going to mash this up, dolls and simulation. And I'm going to be like, oh, here's one idea. I could have 20 ideas inside of this piece. And those ideas can also be put on sticky notes. And you can actually draw those ideas if you feel so inclined. And once you get into like the design process. But how this is useful, for example, in your context. So say you, um, when, when um, some of your people that you provide services for get home from military life and they need to figure out what their next move is, how they uh, make their way in the world without outside of the military context, then a lot of times you can create a template, you can create a, a, a table, just like a simple grid, and you can write all of the skills that that person has along the top. So maybe they have teamwork. They have language abilities. They're good with money. They are resilient, right? And then along the side, you can put anything you want. You know, you could put locations. You could put, um, you could put people that maybe have resources for them. You just put variables here, and you, you smash them up, and you see what happens. And you don't have to get this right. Like this is full blown experimentation meaning you can get preposterous, ridiculous ideas, and that is actually the point of this process, so that you can say, oh, I never thought I would come home from service and open a food truck, but I think I'm going to do that. And the reason I'm going to do that is because I did this experimental game where I put these things together, and this is the idea that was born. And I wouldn't have thought of it on my own, but I thought of it because I collided two previously unknown variables and came up with an idea that actually resonated with me, right? So this, I hope this makes sense. This is just essentially a, um, the willful and purposeful mashup of ideas because they, um, it creates an exponential awakening of possibility. And you, you can use that for a whole host of things. Like you might put your agencies across the top and your collaborators on the side and be like, oh my God, we could actually do a programming initiative with this agency in this way I never would have thought of it and you don't the intention is not to like do this right the intention is to use this to activate possibility so I see I have three minutes and I that was my last experiment but there are hundreds of experiments like that that leverage visual thinking so I do hope together that you got a sense of the value of it I know it's a big topic area but I hope you also started to percolate around how might it be useful for you your lives and in your work and in your efforts and in your carrying out of this movement toward um, a really robust system you know that, that's the intention of it is to make it work for you so um i really appreciate here's my poodle haircut for those of you who are missing it i really appreciate your being with me and i'm, I'm definitely interested and available for any questions that you have thank you so much sunny that was absolutely awesome, awesome. Uh, a lot of great uh, comments in the chat and um, uh, appreciation for your uh, presentation and also some explanations of slot cars if you want oh. to look that up in the chat <laughs> oh uh, window like, as, yeah. <laughs> as well. So um, there's there's pretty much a consensus around what slot cars are. Oh, good. The, I'm sure yeah. you guys would know. <laughs> so uh, thank you again, Sunny. That was, that, that was really awesome. I, I really appreciate it. I want to remind everybody who's uh, tuned in today that we're offering several options for you to pursue continuing education credits as well as certificates. And Sunny, actually, if I could get you to flip towards the end of your stack of slides there, yes. there's one about continuing education. Yeah. And that would, that, that would help. And maybe, yeah, there we go. Hopefully that will focus in on that web address because that's where you need to go for this information and the instructions on how to get your continuing education credits, detailed information on the types, the number of credits available can be found uh, on the conference session pages as well. If this is your last session with us for the entire virtual conference, you're not going to attend our second session today or our making connection session or anything tomorrow, a link to the evaluation can be found on the same web page as the continuing education uh, credits. The evaluation may be taken only once please be sure to wait to take the evaluation until you've attended your last conference session. So only 
you do the evaluation if this is your last conference session. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Thanks again for an awesome presentation. Sunny My Brown, pleasure. thank you very much. We are going to be on a 30-minute break. Please join us at, at 1 p.m. Eastern time as Russ Linden presents Collaboration Across Yay. Boundaries. See you in a half an hour. I wish I could see. So, Sunny, yeah, if you want to, you can, do you have the chat open? I wish I had it open when people were, because I, I guess it kicked away, but. There's, there's, there were no pressing questions. Okay, great. But I just, yeah, I just thought you'd be interested in, in, in those. I am. Um, so there were a few questions about basic tools for creating electronic representations of doodles. Creating, oh, like um, apps and tablets and stuff. Mm -hmm. Should I write that? Should I write, I'll type that in there. Awesome, thanks. Yeah, for sure. Creating electronic representations. I use Adobe Sketchpad and a digital tablet. You can. Hello. Hey, Sunny. I'm I'm still here, and we're still here, as and and some folks are still in the room as we wait for our next session. Okay. Yeah, because I know you guys need to get to your next session. Right. Um, we'll be having to do some some mic checks and things like that with Russ as soon of as course. Russ is in the room. Just so, just so you know that. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna share uh, before you jump off. I'm gonna share a private uh, chat with you with a comment so that you don't have to find it, but it was just a very uh, meaningful comment. I think a lot of people noticed it in the chat. So I'm going to just okay, send good. it to you directly so okay, you no get a chance to see it. <laughs>